Welcome back to Citizens Forum. Uh, this is the second segment, and uh, we have with us today Mazen Al Nahawi. Mazen is uh, uh, is a Syrian Palestinian Syrian from Damascus, Syria, and. Uh, We've asked Mazen to come in today because of the recent events that have happened in the Eastern Mediterranean, particularly around this uh, this uh, chemical attack, so-called chemi chemical attack that happened last week, that uh, and the response of the United States to this uh, to this chemical attack. Um, so, welcome to the show, Mazen. There's Thank lots you. lots of things to talk about here, but um, maybe firstly, if you could just set up you know, what brought you to Canada? What, you, what was your experience in Syria? And also, what background is your family in Syria? Um, I'm a Palestinian refugee from Syria. I grew up in Syria, born in Damascus, 1968. I am graduated from the High Institute of Drama and uh, Linguistic uh, it's, uh, in Damascus. I, I have a major as a critic and linguistic and e been trained to study my history, my language, and my background very, very well. Plus, uh, the connection between Syria and Palestine, it is for, could be for many people as, as a separate things. But uh, for example, the uncle of my father was the mayor of the town of Douma, which have the so-called chemic attack in it. Because before 1948, so in a big part of my family life, Palestine was always a province or a small part of a bigger homeland called Syria. And uh, it, it, uh, the theft of the Palestinian land and the establishment of the Israeli apartheid state on, Palest in, on Palestine in 1948, it's, it's a Syrian wound in the first place, not only for the Palestinian. Now they tell you there is no such a people called Palestinian, but um, since Herodotus, you know, have you heard of Herodotus? Oh, yeah. The father of history, um, if you open his book and search for the word Palestine, you always read that he tell you that it's the part of Syria that connected with Egypt. So since 500 BCE, at least, until the 1948, we know that Syria and Palestine, one piece of land. If the Western, they would like to divide our history or they are ignorant of our history, it's up to them, but they cannot really come and teach us about what is Syria and what is Palestine rather. The, the issue, um, uh, there is very, uh, when I sit down and hear the media we have, uh, CFAX or CTV or global media, I really wonder about what kind of uh, marijuana or weed they smoke because I would like to get that strain. It's their short memory. It's amazing. I would like to join that club and sit down and laugh when they talk about their news. Because yeah. when it comes, for example, when you, um, as you mentioned, Syria, we have the du Duma attack lately, um, the yeah. chemical, so called chemical attack. We have CTV and CFAX and global media asking the Pentagon and Washington DC to report about this issue. As if like, just, I would like to mention what Martin Luther King described the USA. It's as the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. If I show you, I have a list here, just wars that the USA have done since 1945 only. Not, no, not talking about their biggest problem, the worst genocide ever in history, what done to the indigenous people here. We're talking about just from 1948. This is the list of the countries that the USA went and destabilized, attacked and destroyed, assassinate their mini prime ministers or whatever, just to dominate them and bring them to the American market. Now how, what, where these so-called journalists, Canadian we have here, we, how they forget about that. And suddenly now, the USA is the one who decide whether Syria did the chemical attack or not, and go and punish them directly after that. Okay, so let's try to get into that a bit. It's a big subject, so. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's huge. And I, when I first saw the footage uh, in the late news of uh, of uh, the coverage, immediate coverage after this so-called uh, chemical attack, and I immediately thought it didn't look genuine 
Mm. And, and, and the next day, actually, some of the mainstream media was talking about the it was hard for them to establish whether it was a bona fide attack or not. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think, for instance, do you think there was a, a chemical attack orchest orchestrated by the Syrian government last week? For sure, I cannot say anything, but there is something called common sense and logic. The Syrian, they were dealing with the last small bucket in the Gota, east, eastern Ghouta. Why at that moment to go and use chemical attack when they are succeeding on the ground? First, second thing, the one who brought the issue of the chemical attack to a group, White Helmet, and a group called Syrian American Medical Association or whatever. Okay, the so first tell us one, about the White Helmets. Enough to say that the White Helmet was established by a British mercenary. He wasn't a doctor. They work only in the area where Jibhat al-Nasra and many Islamic factions who brought to Syria, the American, the British, the French, in the help with the Qatari, Saudi, Turkey. Yeah. Actually, Qatar, the Prince of Qatar, after the latest attack from Saudi against Qatar, he went and exposed the whole plan, what's happening in Syria. Yeah. Syria as a country has no debt for the IMF. It's a secular country. I study in our and in Syria. I paid 25 cents for tuition in one of the prestigious school in Syria. When the government pay for me around 2,000 every year, health is free. Why they go after Syria? What about going after Saudi Arabia, for example? Who oh, women? We don't see them in the street. Who oh, we ha we we know what is Saudi Arabia? The most disgusting regressive regime on earth, and Saudi Arabia now. The American asking the Saudi Arabia and Qatar and Emirates to come and take over after they go out of, from Syria. Yeah. So I, I don't know, again, how when we represent the stories here in our media, I know why. They are in bed, basically. And I, by the way, I like to speak things simple and honest, but I can't support anything I say with facts. Like, for example, these list of four, if you go and check them, each one of them have an every single war the U.S. did was based on a lie. But again, how are we going to let this media again create a new war, destabilize another sovereign country, add more blood on their hand, and when the issue becomes obvious at slides, they move on to a new war? Unt until when we want to take this trash media we have here? Now, I think, you know, we should be looking for a way, a way forward, you know, a way, a, some, something that, that a process, uh, and particularly for the media to, is there anything that you'd recommend to the media that, who, who they should go to, to try to establish the facts? I actually, I believe more, you know, George Carlin, Carlin? Yeah. <laughs> he said, maybe the public sucks. Actually, the problem in people, I think. If, for example, I call the CRTC, wondering about when I hear false news or misinformation, I mean, are you really waiting for me as a citizen, as a worker coming until the end of my day or as anybody else to go really and try to submit a complaint about them? What about you in the first place? Establish some standard yeah. about when you say false information, yeah. you would be prosecuted. Yeah. <laughs> or you would be, there is some consequences here. It's yeah. not up to citizen to go and open the phone and talk. I did call uh, Bell Media when they said talk about the issue of the Russian poisoning, the two spies, whatever. I said, would you please just, do you have any base for the whole accusation you are Saying about Russia, when you bring that American guy, he said that how shameful they want to go and visit them after they try to kill them. What is the base for all that? He told me that is my opinion. Asking for facts and evidence, it's become an opinion. Meanwhile, what CFAX give us and Bell Media and CTV, these are the news for you guys. Just swallow it and shut up. I mean, this is seem like the story. Yeah, so there's no way to really hold the these media outlets accountable uh, in, in, a, in a legal fashion at the moment that we don't have unless people start make them feel yeah know that we know what you are doing we don't have your short memory 
We know what, who are the American, that they are the one who used deployed uranium in Iraq, killed thousands and thousands in Fallujah. We have kids growing up in two heads because of their deployed uranium. Until now, Vietnamese people affected from the orange Asian, the, 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 the spray on them, phosphor bombs, all kinds. Who are the Pentagon or Washington DC to come and tell us that the Syrian government did 50 attack and killed 200 people? 50, they said that in the United Nations. They represented the there. Syrian government used so far 50 chemical attacks did and they killed 200 people. The Syrian ambassador told her, we could, we could kill that 200 people in one regular bomb. I mean, if, why we need to or go all the any, distance? Any, any, if, any attack. Yes, can saw. you imagine why the Syrian government go use chemic attack, open the hell door on them to kill an average four people? I mean, even if they are, as they say, criminal or whatever. But yeah. the issue in Syria needs to be left to the Syrian themselves to decide, yeah. not to again the criminal state that Martin Luther King talk about, and we all know about their war, not for that state to come and bring their democracy. Right. I think we have just little time left, I think, and we have the issue of Palestine. And as I mentioned, Palestine is always part of Syria. We have coming in the 15th of May, a Nakba anniversary. Right. And what's a Nakba mean? A Nakba mean catastrophe. It's the establishment of the Israeli state on the Palestinian land. And by the way, Canadian involved to their neck, if not to the ear, with that issue because the plan submitted the United Nations to give 55% of Palestine for Europe, ma mainly European Jews was submitted by Supreme Court of Canada. So in spite of the whole history of Canada of colonization, expelling and taking over the indigenous people here, they don't mind to go and continue with the other thing. Mm -hmm. So on the 15th of May, this is the catastrophe anniversary, anniversary when, my when my family got expelled from Palestine and until today, we cannot like, for example, I cannot fly over just because I am Palestinian. Like for example, if I wanna go from Damascus to Egypt and the airplane had to go over the homeland that my family lived for century, I need to choose another route. I cannot be. So, but if yeah. you are from Manhattan, Chile, China, and adopted, become a Jew, you become immediately a citizen of that state. Can you imagine if you say, if you become Muslim, we will take you immediately in that state and we give you a citizenship? What people will think of the state? I mean, but. Again, that happened to the Palestinian, and not strange that Canada has handled that because her history mainly about colonialism and special one, subtler colonialism. Yeah, and I know that uh, we're just running out of time, as and, and there's so much to talk about here. <laughs> um, but when we're thinking about this and. Uh, I, I think if we did have some type of a watchdog organization in Canada that had, had some clout, uh, I think that would do, some, do a lot of, uh, would do us all well that we could have a chance to check these facts and when stories come out that really appear to be fabricated, uh, they can't go unchallenged. Mm -hmm. Simply, again, that as they say, think globally and act locally. People, the problem, we, we lost all the gra grassroots organization movement that really work on behalf of people. Unless people come back and do this, there is yeah. no way. Up to the people in the end, not up to the government or our media. No, they are selling us the news, period. Okay. Okay, on that note, we'll uh, leave it at that. Thank you very, uh, very much for coming in today, Madsen. It was a pleasure. And let me say one thing, Lost. I thank you and thank Jack for all the community, community TV work you're doing. And by the way, I am so happy when I see, like, for example, somebody like Mahdi Najjar come and talk about many important issues. This man, I, whenever I hear him, he's like a mentor. So thanks for bringing voices like that on the show. It was our pleasure. Thank you. So that uh, completes this segment of Citizens Forum.
Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. It is Wednesday, April the 25th. I'd like to start by thanking the Shaw staff and our great volunteer crew who make this show possible. Our first guest is, is it Isadora? Or Isadora. Isadora Godchild. Yes. And we're going to be talking about starting with housing, yes. but hopefully getting to neo-Nazism. <laughs> okay. Starting okay, with housing. Well, and the two are definitely interlinked. Oh, they're certainly be interlinked. Um, now, I have been harping on this lack of affordable housing for quite some time now, but what is more important than a roof over your head, food in your stomach, and clothes on your back, right? Those are your basic necessities. Now, I mentioned in the previous, uh, or previous shows, one of them back then anyways, that there was this plethora of uh, housing being built, but I was somewhat skeptical of whether any of this was really going to uh, be for affordable housing, right? Well, then a few months later, I read an article and it was, and the headline of it said, construction booming, but market still bleak for renters in Victoria and it Vancouver. Yes, exactly. And the rental availability rates are at 0.5%. And one, re, uh, one um, um, rental uh, um, organization or whatever said that, you know, only about, she started about 16 years ago, and she said they used to have to uh, entice people with microwaves and half month uh, rent to get people to even look at their places. <laughs> now, for every one that comes up, there's like 20, 30, 40 people lined up just to get the, this one apartment. Yeah. I just want to say that I, I think, and I really I'm quite sure, that it's deliberate. They, have, they, the people who run our country, the corporations mm -hmm. and the politicians they control, federally, provincially mm -hmm. and municipally, mm -hmm. have deliberately created this disastrous mm -hmm. situation yeah. because mm -hmm. the 1% of the 1% are making fortunes from it. Absolutely, absolutely. And there and another thing is that the the foreign investment right is still escalating exponentially, right? Because these are investing, invest in this, invest in the you know, cuz cuz it, it, it's somewhere to plant their money. They don't want to plant any people. <laughs> but they want to plant their money somewhere, right? And so they're planting money, but not people. Kind and of they thing. say that in Greater Vancouver, there are 60,000, between 45,000 and 60,000. These are the two numbers I saw mm -hmm. coming from the city. Between 45,000 and 60,000 empty homes That's in the Greater right. Vancouver area. That's right. You know, a lot of foreign investment, a lot of mm -hmm. out of mm -hmm. province. It's mm -hmm. crazy. And our government just said, mm -hmm. come in, do it. Do it to people who need housing. Just screw mm -hmm, them. Mm -hmm. And the thing because people are making money. Well, uh, just I think the other day it was Gregor Robinson was saying that they're putting an empty home tax on pla on empty places that should generate uh, thirty million dollars or has generated thirty million dollars, and that they were going to put that to alleviate the um, the housing crisis but we've heard lip service concern for 30 years now right is let's hope we all we can do is hope that that's that that will be the case but until we actually see it on a realistic level then it, it remains lip service and then there was the and it says you know another new a news article was saying you know it's really hell out there for renters and the influx of people that are coming to the West Coast, which I have dubbed the Riviera of Canada. Well, it's true. <laughs> you know, and all the prices to match that, right? You know, kind of thing. And it, so as it continues to remain the Riviera, just hordes and hordes of people are coming. Yeah, not it, they, hordes. Well, literally, I tell you, when I was coming here, I had to wait for two buses because they were completely f from Schwartz Bay because I got off the ferry then the big ferry came in and literally two buses left with pack jam full of people and I thought I'm waiting for the third one yes the problem is the people who live elsewhere mm -hmm. and are investing in our housing just because they got money that's the problem that's what I'm and our saying. governments who let yes. it happen and the corporations yes. who are behind it all yes. that yes. is the enemy well like I said they're, they're they want to plant their money somewhere and it's in real estate and that's where they're planting their money and stuff so uh this is really really what but 
with with this empty home now even on the on the uh, gulf islands they are also experiencing a, a housing crisis there because there are a lot of uh, people who want to employ people are having a hard time finding workers because there's nowhere for them to live and they and they're living in cars and huts and tents and all you know throughout the throughout the um, the uh, Gulf Islands and stuff because they just can't find um, what kind of crazy country does not build enough homes well, that's for the people it. who live there it is I absolutely know. insane well, but as I said, some people are making a lot of money. Well, from it. that's it, and and actually, when I was watching this me uh, this uh, short documentary on poverty, as I was mentioning uh, um, earlier, was in Britain, which is the sixth most uh, wealthiest country in the world, have about thirty thousand um, uh, homeless single families there that have that have a hard time finding sustainable housing. So single there. parent families. Single parent families, right. And austerity is, is, is continuing to put the squeeze on them. And as one person described it in the commentary, it, he, he described it as conscious cruelty. Yeah, conscious cruelty. That's you know? exactly what it is. And that's what it is. So on that dim note, we're going to switch gears here. Okay. And um, I wanted to address how vitally important uh, community television is and community voices that don't have anywhere to, to speak about any issues that are not covered in the mainstream media. Be and the, the, the platform um, provides this, the community TV and all the amazing volunteers that come in to, to help and do this. I mean, thank you all so much because we really appreciate it big time because you know it's and to shut down community tv why you're paying big bucks for these people i don't think so <laughs> you know they're all volunteers because they want to be here to give people a voice that's why they're here to do this so i would also like to um uh read this uh, this is um, a commentary by a an investigative journalist uh, whose name is Chris Hedges. He's American. He used to work in the mainstream media and basically got booted out because he was a dissident voice to the narrative of that what they wanted to uh, to um, uh, propagandize. So here's what he, his commentary is. It goes, our culture is awash in lies dominated by streams of never-ending electronic hallucinations that merge fact and fiction until they are indistinguishable. We have become the most delusional society on earth. Politics is a species of endless and meaningless political theater. Politicians have morphed into celebrities. Our two ruling parties are in reality one party, the corporate party. And those who attempt to puncture this vast, breathless universe of fake news designed to push through the cruelty and exploitation of, neo, of the neoliberal order are pushed so far to the margins of society, including by the public broadcasting systems that have sold its soul for corporate money that we may as well be mice squeaking against an avalanche. But squeak, we must. <laughs> well read, well read. There. And that was Chris Hedges. Chris Hedges, yeah. he's an American yeah. Yeah. Uh, in independent journalist. Thank you very much. And he's on RT, if anybody... He but, is, but he's, he's on On Contact, on RT. And RT is an independent um, um, alternative I think, media. I think independent in quotation marks. Well, yeah, yeah, independent, but it's alternative. Yeah. And it really, and they have investigative journalists yeah. that really dig deep to find the truth. And, and Including uh, one of our great heroes, the governor. Uh, the governor. <laughs> Jesse, Jesse Ventura. Oh, Jesse Ventura, yes. Oh, my God. Yes. What is it? What is he called? It? The, um, what's the name of his show? Uh, Jesse, I don't know, uh, something, something or other. <laughs> but yeah, they, now, say, but they, yeah. They, they do say some stuff that... Oh, they're uh, great. And I mean, they put on people that they would not put on mainstream. For example, Eva Bartlett. 
She's amazing. She's an, she's a Canadian in um, in um, a journalist, investigative journalist, and she went right into Syria and just told the absolute truth and facts of what was really going on there. She was censored. She was demonized. She was this that. Vanessa Beely, another one, right? And and all these amazing people, they actually go and they dig deep into what's really happening because these they the truth needs to be told. And one thing I've I'm just going to say something about Syria, okay. which is. The whole story, in my opinion, the whole story we're being told in CTV, CBC, CFAX, oh, yeah. it's all a lie. Yeah, it's, well, this is it. And it's really... It's the United States is conducting a war of terror. Yes, that's correct. That's what correct. right do they have yeah. to go into an... And all I the lies... I mean, yeah. don't just don't believe what they're telling you mm -hmm. because they mm -hmm. do not care about you. CTV, CBC, Global, they do not mm -hmm. care about you. They want to control our country, the 1% of the 1% who owns all the big media. Mm -hmm. And they do control the message totally. It's, mm -hmm. it's impossible to have a democracy in that kind of a situation. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is why they want to shut down all these alternative media and stuff is because there's nothing pathological liars hate and fear more, and that's the truth. And there's nothing that warmongers hate more, and that's peaceful solutions. <laughs> you know, and that's really, in a way, what it all kind of boils down to, you know. So, yeah, so we might as well be my squeaking against the avalanche, but squeak we must <laughs> well said Isadora <laughs> you know, so, squeak we must yeah so yeah ah. so yeah what do you think about PR I'm so for it oh my gosh we so desperately need that there's no <laughs> doubt about it right? you know what the PR people should hire you because they need this message <laughs> and in Technicolor <laughs> yes <Woo -hoo. laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely, because as I said, we're, it's like, you know, we've been living in this kind of this, you know, this, this neo-Nazi uh, fascist regime masquerading as this grand democracy and, you know, in the world, and it's simply not true. Now, when she says neo-Nazi fascist regime masquerading as a democracy, personally, I agree. Um, what is what because it Nazism to? just means it's the or fascism is just okay. the the collection of the corporate and the government. Well, it's censorship of this, censorship yeah. of free speech, censorship of dis, de, dissidents, censorship of uh, of um, whistleblowers, censorship of this, that. Well, what is that then? That's not a democracy. That's not true and free now, speech. Now, causing trouble, causing British yes. the people of BC to fight the people of Alberta over their pipeline. And the whole media is in on it. We are the enemy because we okay. dare to stand against the pipeline, which, by the way, the big unions don't want built mm -hmm. because it's bad for jobs in Alberta. The Alberta Federation of Labor is opposed to it, but the media never oh. tells us that. It's all a pack yeah. of lies. Yeah, no kidding, exactly. So, I mean, that's it. And uh, the, um, excuse me, the, um, that's why there is such, there's, there's such this persecution and demonization of anybody who wants to stand up and reveal the truth against against these these uh, tissue of uh, these litany of lies that, that just gets circulated like this uh, you know uh, never ending uh, wheel of corruption or something. <laughs> you know? So oh my gosh, I gotta get. Some We're out of time, <laughs> but you're absolutely right. Thank you very much for watching this segment of <laughs> Citizens Forum. <laughs>
It will be completed by the end of November 2018. It will be a mail-in ballot. They've decided a threshold for passing is 50% plus one. There's no minimum number of votes and it's not counted per riding. It's just across all the people who vote. If 50% plus one person votes for this, this is a binding referendum. So if this measure passes, the next election in 2021 will be conducted under some form of proportional representation. Wow. So uh, where are we at now? What are we waiting for from the government? Or, uh, and what can we expect uh, going forward? So we're, we're eagerly awaiting the next steps, which is some more details on how this is going to roll out, when the ballots are actually going to be mailed, how long people are going to have to, to fill in. But there's other bigger questions that we're also eagerly awaiting which is the financing rules. Financing rules includes uh, campaign donations, how this referendum is going to be run. Um, we're also waiting to see there may be official proponent and opponent groups chosen and funding given to them, as uh, it is very likely that corporate donations and union donations and large personal donations will be banned. But we don't know all those details, so we're eagerly awaiting those. We're also very eagerly awaiting what the specific question is on the ballot. So right now, uh, there was a period of public consultation, and uh, that period ended at the end of February, where the Attorney General's office published a questionnaire, an online questionnaire, a survey, and they took the uh, responses from British Columbians on what they thought should be in the referendum question. So not only are they seeking people's opinion on the question, but on how to hold the referendum and how to, how to make it fair. So that period now, um, the Attorney General's office is studying all those responses and the official responses from groups on all sides of the issue to come up with what they consider a fair question. And we're eagerly awaiting any day now uh, word of all those additional details. All right. So that kind of lays out what the, the, the environment that we're working in is. is now, the, the question is, is what, what does Fair Vote Canada have to seek in all of this? I mean, clearly, you're looking for a fair vote. But uh, what is the organization broadly doing? And maybe what is uh, the Greater Victoria chapter of Fair Vote Canada doing locally? So Fair Vote Canada is one of the more established groups because it's a, a lobbying group specific to this issue. And this is not their first time around the block. Uh, they have been active in campaigns in different provinces and federally. Uh, they have a wealth of knowledge and research on the issues because there's a lot of things that are known that you can get from other countries that have adopted proportional representation and the results that they've had in their government. So Fair Vote Canada is largely a wealth of information. There are many, many other groups that are in favor of proportional representation and they formed a loose alliance called the Make Every Voter Count Alliance. And that includes uh, lobbying groups like Fair Vote Canada and Fair Voting BC that are specific to this issue. It includes many, many uh, environmental organizations like Sierra Club and Dogwood and Lead Now. And the other big component of this alliance is many unions have, have joined in that they believe that changing our electoral system is to the advantage of the working person. So they have joined together in a big coalition to move this forward. Fair Vote Canada is just one individual group within this umbrella group supporting this initiative. Locally here in, in Victoria, we have a Fair Vote Canada chapter. I've got over 200 people on our mailing list now. Mainly we focus on the ground game, which means door knocking, tabling, talking to people on street corners. Largely it's an educational role. We do a lot of speaking at public events and uh, we also give advice on some of the more technical details and system details to some of these other groups in the Alliance and generally share the wealth of the knowledge of Fair Vote Canada with the other partners that are in favor of proportional representation. All right, that's uh, it's certainly valuable to have in a conversation like this is a little bit of experience. Um, now, I guess I mean, it's, that's all well and good knowing kind of the institutional uh, setup, but uh, what brings you to this uh, this this campaign like what uh, wh what about proportional representation is so important to you? Well, it goes back a ways um, 
I've been involved largely in environmental organizations from a long time ago. I moved up to Victoria 16 years ago and started to branch out a bit as I had a bit more time. So rather than just being kind of a backbencher, I um, started to campaign for individual candidates for public office because I saw that as a way of moving things forward that was important to me. And campaigning for candidates, uh, this was at municipal level and then later at the federal level, uh, you do a lot of door knocking, you talk to people, you promote your candidate. And I started to hear the same message over and over again on the doorstep. And they'd say, yeah, you know, your candidate has some good ideas, but sorry, I really can't vote for them because I don't think they have a chance of winning and I want to prevent so-and-so from getting in office, so I have to vote for this person. So that was one kind of line of reasoning I'd get a lot. We call it strategic voting. The other thing that you get a lot on the doorstep is, sorry, not interested, nothing to do with me, don't want to talk to you. And mm -hmm. that's, that's voter apathy. They don't figure their opinion counts, that, that it would make any difference, and they just don't want to get involved in the political process. So uh, when the referendum was announced for BC, I decided that rather than lobbying for any particular candidate, say in the municipal elections coming up, that I would work on the issue of PR itself because I became more and more convinced that the way to move forward on the issues that are important to me is to have government that better represents my values and to be able to elect people that I believe in. So it doesn't matter that my issues are environmental. For many other people, the same thing is true. Whatever their issues are, they want to see themselves represented in the legislature. And if you don't feel that's happening now or you can't, you're fighting the strategic voting all the time, you're fighting voter apathy, it won't lead to government that moves forward. So I decided to dedicate my time in 2018 to working on proportional representation. Right, and so I, can I help me out here? Because, I mean, I appreciate everything you've just said there. Um, I think there's a lot of people that feel that way. Um, I guess if you can better, uh, or maybe enlighten me as to how proportional representation would actually affect the change th that you're talking about as far as, I mean, just besides, besides being able to potentially get somebody that you prefer into the legislature, um, how else does it kind of change the way that we elect people? Well, the gist of it is very simple, can be explained very simply. Whatever proportional system is ultimately chosen, the proportion of the seats in the legislature will match that of the popular vote in BC. A lot of people think that happens right now, but it doesn't. Mm. So it's a basic issue of fairness. And right now, our voting system, first past the post, kind of works for a two-party system. But in Canada, both federally and provincially, we haven't had a two-party system in a long time. So what happens in a, a first past the post is the two lead parties kind of tend to get most of the votes and any third or fourth or fifth parties get squeezed out of the pie and don't get any seats. It also, it results in uh, false majorities where a government is elected with less than 50% of the popular vote. And almost every single election, all but one in BC in the last 17 elections has been a false majority where one party can control all of the power with less than 50% of the vote and often less than 40% of the vote. And that's just not fair and it's not right. By bringing more parties to the table, actually really to the table in the legislature, more voices will be heard, more cooperation will have to be take, taking place, more dialogue will happen before decisions are made so that decisions won't flip-flap from one uh, government to the next. Mm -hmm. So um, it has been proven over and over again in many other countries that this is beneficial to society. So that's, uh, that's what I think about mm -hmm. that. I, I totally agree with you. I, I personally think that um, the necessity of collaboration and cooperation between parties um, is the one key lever that I think is going to change the way that politics is done in, in this province. Um, now, I mean, this is, this is all really cool for BC. I mean, I, I think the, the hope, of course, is that proportional representation will pass, uh, certainly for Fairville Canada. Um, but Fairville Canada is a national organization. It's across the country. Um, do you see uh, this campaign having kind of broader effects across the country or, um, or is this uh, more just an issue of British Columbia or bust? 
Well, it would benefit BC certainly, but the goals of Fair Vote Canada do extend beyond BC. There's also going to be a referendum coming up in Prince Edward Island. And if we were to win in BC, if there was to be a win in Prince Edward Island, we kind of have both ends of the, the country bookmarked a bit. And that would certainly give a strong indication to the federal government to listen to the people. Um, there's things happening in Ontario as well as, as there has been in the past with PR. So it's, um, you know, one small step at a time. This is not a thing that happens overnight. It mm. takes a while to get to cooperative government, and it's a process. But uh, we, we'd really love if BC was the first giant step in this process for Canada. Yeah, I, I, I'd, again, it's, uh, I, I think that's probably fair. Something was brought up to me recently. Uh, just uh, curious about your thoughts on this. Um, I, uh, clearly, provincial politics is is rife or ripe for the uh, the possibility of proportional representation. Um, do you think that success provincially uh, will actually uh, result in maybe federal uh, proportional representation? Well, the reason that it hasn't moved forward, both provincially and federally, is because of this false majoritarian results that we have federally as well as provincially. So, whoever is in the power it's typically in their best interest to stay in power and they want that false majority. They want all that power with their 39% of the vote. So they actively campaign against it. So we really need a groundswell of support and if we can get it in some of the provinces, then we have a much better chance to get it federally by lobbying our federal po politicians. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think getting that first uh, domino down uh, over that first hurdle is gonna make uh, Canadians in, in general a lot less uneasy about the idea of changing to something that uh, so many people in the establishment have been uh, railing on about how uh, how terrible it is. Now I think we're just about time time's up here so uh, maybe if you can fill us in on how uh, if people want to help uh, with your organization locally or if uh, they want to get a hold of you and learn more about proportional representation or it, you said that you do speeches uh, or talks or classes um, maybe just tell people how they can get a hold of you. Uh, I do encourage people to go on the Fair Vote Canada national website. From there, you'll find links for different provinces. Within BC, we have, I think we're up to 22, maybe 26 chapters. So we're not just in the big centers. We're spread all across the province. Conta and there's contact information right there on the page, how to get involved. There's many ways you can get involved right from your armchair at home. We have a writer's group. We have people uh, writing letters. We have people giving presentations. It's not all door knocking. So there's a little bit of everything possibility for volunteers and we're just really rolling getting up into this campaign now so it would be a great time to uh, join in and, and get some support. Well it sounds like you've got your work cut out for you for the next few months. Um, thank you very much for joining us today um, and uh, I wish you all the luck in, in going forward. Um, Ronnie Earnhardt, Chair of the Victoria Chapter of uh, Fairboat Canada and I'm Kaylin Harris. Thank you for joining us today on Citizens Forum. Welcome back. Uh, this is the final segment of Citizens Forum. Jack and I like to uh, just uh, look back over some of the current events over the last couple of weeks and try to figure out some things that's happened in the news. So uh, welcome, Jack, to this segment. Thank you all. Now, um, I brought in a few things, and, and the first thing I brought in, uh, and I'll just hold this up, is, uh, is an article I wrote a few years ago about the Angus Reid polling methods. and. Uh, and uh, Angus Reid just released a, a uh, poll that said that uh, the uh, British Columbians are increasingly supporting the Inbridge or the, the uh, Kinder Morgan pipeline. And that always, uh, for me, it really makes me wonder how exactly they came up with those, uh, with those statistics. So, Jack, uh, how did you feel about that when that poll was brought out? Well, I looked into uh, Angus Reid, just because they, they were on the radio one day and they were saying, just what they were saying, sounded, so they don't poll, Angus Reid does not poll the people of Canada. Angus Reid only polls the members of the Angus Reid Forum. And I mentioned this on Facebook and I got back three responses from people who either they or their friend were members of the Angus Reid Forum, but they all said they don't get polled 
about questions like the Kinder Morgan pipeline because they think they don't give the answers that Angus Reid wants. And there was also a letter to the editor of the Times columnist saying exactly the same thing. So it's very possible that the Angus Reid polling is completely phony, completely phony and manipulative. There should certainly be an investigation. And why does the media keep reporting this? Because the media knows better than we do exactly what Angus Reid does, but they hold them up as this wonderful paragon, Angus Reid, yeah. the most honest polling company. They don't tell us. They don't even tell us the basics, that they don't poll Canadians. You have to be a member of the forum. And secondly, they sure don't tell us that they may be uh, asking only the people they can trust to give the right answers. It was interesting that they also put in in the article I read in the Times columnist that uh, they themselves had paid for the for the poll that they there was no sponsor for that for that poll but they are in fact paid by large corporations to collect data so we we know where they're getting their money usually so it's a very peculiar situation when something of this if this important to this province and you have this type of manipulation I think manipulation of the information very serious issue. Uh, Angus Reid is not a scientific polling organization. Uh, they don't follow any of the rules of standard polling. And uh, basically they, they have a club of some sort that we don't know what it is. And they ask the people that they, that they have in their club what they think. And so if you don't get the right that's answer, That's how much weight we should you. put on their, on their information, far as I'm concerned. Moving right along. Okay, I'll just say, just let me finish off yeah. about that. CTV. CBC, Global, uh, the Times Colonist, the Globe Mail, they all think Angus Reid is uh, well worth reporting because they're all jamming that information down everybody's throat, knowing that very, very possibly it is completely just phony information. Well, this is it, and we're trying to point this out. Look a little harder, folks. By the way, uh, in fact, get to show a couple of these articles that I did read this week and uh, something I pointed out last week that um, uh, Kinder Morgan, uh, the company itself started out uh, as a spin-off from Enron and they, the, not only the president as we mentioned last week but the vice president as well as several of the senior executives all became part of the Kinder Morgan uh, company in 1996 uh, and soon after Enron went into a tailspin and ended up in, in Enron, court. one of the greatest frauds in financial frauds in history and the kinder of Kinder Morgan is was the president or CEO of Enron it's that's and right. that doesn't so, even get mentioned so anyway I brought in the two articles uh, one is uh, facts about Kinder Morgan Canadian taxpayers need to know in the tie very very well researched article looking at the business case for uh, building the pipeline there's just simply isn't one uh, and the second article I brought in, it was basically uh, another article in, in the in the TIE called "Don't Take the Bait." Kinder Morgan is playing Canada, and and again this this article really looks at who these guys are, and and what they're doing, particularly if you look at the developments with uh, Kinder Morgan now apparently backing out and uh, the federal uh, government and the. Alberta government stepping in and willing to take taxpayers' money to build this pipeline. So one really has to wonder, well, what is going on? There's no business case for this. This absolutely is a disaster for the environment. And we have huge ecological and environmental problems in this world, all linked to mostly to our use of fossil fuels. And we seemingly can't get Get this yoke off of us, Jack. And you know, have to wonder what, who is behind Prime Minister Trudeau and Rachel Notley? Like, who's pulling the strings, really? Well, corporate Canada, of course. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, we, are, we do live in a, basically a corporate dictatorship. Um, I think corporate Canada controls all the big parties. Um, they own the media and they control the message. So now there's pe you know, people in BC standing up against the pipeline and, and what's happening? Um, the, the politicians are just lambasting us. The courts are arresting people. The media, 
I mean, CFAX, CFAX, our local number one corporate radio station owned by Bell Media, cannot say enough about how wrong we are, those of us who oppose the pipeline. And, and the way they say it is no matter how much the oil industry and Alberta, they give and they give and they give, but we will not be appeased. That's the message from uh, really all the media, especially CFAX. And even the unions are against it. Yeah. The unions, the, the, the Alberta Federation of Labor and Unifor, the number one union representing 12,000, they're against it because they say it's bad for jobs. And yet, it doesn't matter. We get this message. It's, it's, it just shows how deep the lie is. And now, because the people are opposed to a pipeline, they're splitting the country apart. They, the, you know, the oil industry, the big boys, are splitting our country apart because we don't want a pipeline. Well, you know, if you look at it, I mean, if you look at the Enbridge uh, pipeline, and if you look at the Kinder Morgan pipeline, uh, if you look at uh, the building of Site C Dam, for instance, uh, and, and Accenture, the, 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 the administration wing of BC Hydro, again, another company that spun off of, uh, of the Enron Corporation, uh, you start to realize that this is quite a small club they have, but boy, do they have a lot of power. And they've also given the Liberal government of British Columbia hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars that goes into their campaign war chest, which I think, Jack, is going to be used a lot in this upcoming uh, debate over uh, proportional representation. I think we're, we, you talk about disinformation coming up. Brace yourself, right? because they got millions of dollars to spend on ads and on disinformation. And, and I think, you know, the public is going to be battered by the time this referendum vote comes up. And they are the experts at manipulating the fears of the public. They're the experts at manipulating the language. Uh, and uh, here we are, the, the regular folks in this country just dying, just begging for some fairness somewhere and uh, our chances are you know the the whole referendum on on proportional representation is, is such a tricky situation we have if the NDP do not get behind this properly and completely both feet jump in and show that logically it makes so much sense to have uh, any any other type of electoral system than one we have because we really can't do much worse than what we have right now other than a full-on dictatorship but uh, how far off are we from a dictatorship really if if one party has been ruling this province for the last 50 or 60 years basically with a few interludes with the NDP what what chances do we have we, we have to change this electoral system the thing is I think what I'm trying to put across today is that this whole idea of how we get our information we have to work at it. It's not, not just something to lazily get, gaze at the TV and get a few clips and think that we have an opinion. We have to work now, folks. We have to really get down and do some work and educate ourselves because that's the only way we're going to be able to bring anything forward in this province and in Canada. Well, a big problem is the media is so... I mean, even people say they don't believe it, but we do believe it. You know, people do believe that Russia has become the bad guy. Um, uh, maybe they have. I don't know that, you know, Syria used chemical weapons. Maybe they have. But I know one thing, that I have completely stopped believing anything in the corporate-owned media. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not true. But just because they say it, I will not believe it because they have lied to me my entire life. I believed in the war in Vietnam. I believed, you know, that America was fighting for truth, justice, and, you know, the American way and democracy. What a pack of lies that was. And coming out of it, I began to realize it, it's all a pack of lies. It's the, the corporate media is the propaganda arm of the corporate empire that runs this country. And they do not intend to give any of it up. They've got it. They run us. They control us. And they do not intend to stop. Maybe we should talk a little bit about what's happening to this show in the future, because we don't know. Well, actually, it sort of changed the subject, but <laughs> there might be a relationship. Uh, we're still alive. Still alive. We're still on air. Uh, uh, Shaw uh, has sorted out their scheduling, and uh, they have a dramatically reduced staff here in Victoria now and across Canada. Uh, so, uh, Which they shouldn't have, but they have. This is, this is a, an opinion is worthy of expressing because, you know, 
uh, as the they're, clo uh, yeah, they're closing as they're it down. winding down, uh, less and less independent expression of opinions are being being affected. So um, serious business, but in the end, uh, Shaw has sorted things out here in Victoria. Uh, we're going to proceed uh, taping this show every two weeks, and uh, we got to thank them for that. But that is their mandate. <laughs> but we don't even know that because if if you know if the hiatus that we if we were going to be stopped now yeah. that's changed but for how long for two weeks for we don't we don't so we don't we really don't know what the future holds we hope i mean community tv could be and should be great for canada it could be so much better than it is the community has got to take over community tv instead mr trudeau is shutting it down it's it's his decision and it's being closed down it's hard for us to appeal to anyone because uh, because we are equally uh, critical of all everybody, and uh, we uh, subsequently do not have a lot of friends in the political world. <laughs> well, I wrote to uh, Murray Rankin, who's my MP, and uh, Elizabeth May, and the third, the other NDP MP is, I can't remember. Uh, Randall Garrison. Yeah, Randall Garrison. I wrote to all three of them. I haven't heard back. This is two weeks ago. Oh, they're busy people, Jack. Yeah. Uh, I'm not holding my breath <laughs> because nobody <laughs> wants to take on the who wants to take on the media. You have yeah. to be crazy. This is it. I mean, it's such a terrifying notion because uh, they have such power that uh, uh, if uh, they feel that you, that you, for some reason, are not what they want to see, it won't take very long to uh, have some kind of campaign that uh, that will ruin your reputation and all the rest. So it's very serious. So what else do you have, Jack? Any other topics that might be linked into our theme today? Uh, California is using, I've mentioned this before, California is using fracking wastewater to irrigate their crops. I found this out when the oranges I used to buy at Thrifty's started to taste poisonous, and I stopped eating them, and I, I heard this rumor, and I looked into it, and sure enough, California is using fracking wastewater to irrigate their crops, including organics. So uh, if you Google it, you'll find it. Now that's including organic food. There, how could they possibly? I mean, this is something that's so hard to understand. Oh. Well, I think we're out of time. Yes, we're out we're of time. So stay signal. tuned. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, it's always a pleasure to come here every week and uh, do this show. And uh, we're going to see you in a couple of weeks. So uh, we'll see you then. Thank you.